When disaster strikes, most people expect to see it, a storm on the horizon, a column of smoke, a distant sound of explosions, but an EMP isn't like that. An electromagnetic pulse, whether caused by a high altitude nuclear detonation or a targeted non-nuclear device, arrives without warning, without sound, without flash. There is no visible destruction in the sky, no shock wave, no heat, no fire. Yet in the instant it occurs, modern civilization changes. In the United States, life is tethered to electricity in ways most rarely consider. Power plants synchronize across transmission lines. Water systems depend on electric pumps. Hospitals rely on electronic monitors and refrigerated medical supplies. Traffic signals, banking networks, GPS satellites, all of them are interlinked through systems that assume one thing, the power will always be on. A single large-scale EMP could end that assumption in less than a second. Scientists describe it as a wave, a burst of electromagnetic energy sweeping over a region, inducing voltage surges in anything electronic. To the unprepared eye, nothing seems to happen. But instantly, thousands of delicate circuits exceed their tolerance and fail. Computers freeze mid-task, engines stall, phones go dead, the grid flickers out. Across cities, the first signs are small and confusing. Street lights blink off, elevators stop, radios fall silent, aircraft lose navigation signals. The electrical hum of daily life fades into an unnatural quiet. Then confusion turns into realization. This isn't a blackout. Blackouts are temporary. This is electronic paralysis. Backup generators sputter, some working, many failing, depending on whether their components were shielded. Hospitals switch to manual care. Airports halt all departures and landings immediately. Cars built with modern computer-controlled ignition systems simply roll to a stop in traffic lanes, as if the entire nation stalled in the same breath. Yet despite the sudden silence, there are no sirens to explain what happened. Emergency broadcast systems require power. Cell networks require functioning infrastructure. The government can't speak to the public, and the public can't speak to itself. The first hour is defined not by panic, but by absence. The absence of noise, of information, of direction. In that silence, one overwhelming question settles over millions of people at once. What just happened? The first 24 hours, confusion, realization, and breakdown. In the minutes that follow an EMP strike, the United States finds itself suspended between two worlds the familiar one that existed only seconds earlier, and the uncertain one now unfolding. At first, most people assume the outage is temporary. Power flickers all the time. Phones lose signal. Cars stall. These are inconveniences, not emergencies. But as the hour passes, normal explanations begin to fail. Phones do not reconnect. The internet does not return. Automobiles do not restart. Emergency services do not respond. The machinery of modern life has not simply paused. It has gone dark. In cities, traffic grinds to a halt. Without signals or functioning emergency systems, intersections turn into sprawling, silent gridlocks. Drivers step out of their vehicles, exchanging speculation in the rising murmur of confusion. In rural regions, farms and homes feel isolated, cut off from every source of news or direction. Hospitals become the first critical pressure point. With digital records inaccessible, ventilators down, automatic medication dispensers offline, and emergency communications severed, medical staff must operate on training and instinct alone. Supplies that once arrived through a synchronized supply chain will no longer come. In the emergency rooms, doctors whisper the same realization. We're on our own now. Supermarkets and convenience stores soon feel the shift. Refrigerators are dead. Payment systems are offline. Deliveries stop. The global network of just-in-time logistics 
once invisible, always taken for granted, collapses in the span of a few silent hours, people begin to gather information the old way, by moving. Neighbors walk door to door, crowds form around community centers, police stations, and fire departments. But without power, many of these institutions are just as blind and silent as the public they once directed. Government response is present, but distant, unfolding in command centers, and hardened military sites that most citizens will never see. As night falls, the consequences deepen. Cities without light are unfamiliar and intimidating. The glow of street lamps, storefronts, and headlights, gone. A darkness older than modern memory settles in. For the first time in generations, millions of Americans experience night without electricity. And with it, a quiet realization. No one is coming to fix this soon. Government response. What happens behind closed doors? While civilians face confusion, the federal government moves quickly, but inward, not outward. The United States maintains hardened communication networks designed to survive exactly this scenario. Deep underground bunkers, secure satellite relays, military radio bands shielded from EMP effects. These are the backbones of continuity planning, built quietly across decades of Cold War preparation. Within minutes of the EMP strike, the National Military Command Center activates emergency communication protocols. NORAD facilities transition to isolated systems. The president and key members of the executive branch are relocated, if possible, to secure continuity of government sites. These movements are precise, rehearsed, and largely invisible to the public. The greatest question facing leaders is immediate and foundational. Was the EMP an attack? And is a second strike coming? If the EMP was nuclear in origin, launched from a missile, high altitude aircraft, or satellite platform, then the nation may already be under active threat. The first responsibility of national command is not communication. It is prevention of further strikes. Fighter wings scramble under manual command. Strategic submarines surface for radio confirmation. Missile defense radars, those that remain functional, sweep for evidence of trajectory. In this moment, every minute counts. Meanwhile, state and local governments face a harsher reality. Most lack EMP-hardened infrastructure. Emergency coordination systems rely on digital networks now dead. Without radios, without internet, without functioning public alert systems, Governors and mayors cannot issue guidance. Their leadership becomes local and improvisational, often limited to the few buildings with generators that survived the surge. For all the power of the United States, its response capability is divided. Military command remains operational. Civilian infrastructure does not. This disparity creates a vacuum, not of authority, but of communication. Even if the government knows what happened, it cannot tell the public. Not electronically, not instantly. And so, while military planners model escalation risks, civilians remain in darkness, not just without electricity, but without answers. Rumors begin to fill the silence, some hopeful, some fearful, some destructive. In every crisis, information is survival. And right now, information is the scarcest resource in the country. By the second day, the full weight of the crisis begins to settle in. In most American cities, tap water is no longer guaranteed. Water treatment plants and pumping stations rely on electric power and automated controls. Without them, water pressure falls, filtration systems fail, and reservoirs empty without warning. For millions, clean water becomes the first and most immediate scarcity. Families begin boiling water over gas grills and wood fires. Others collect rainwater, melt ice from freezers, or draw from streams and lakes. Some succeed, 
many do not. Waterborne illness, once a rarity in the developed world, returns quietly and quickly. Food follows the same pattern. Grocery shelves, barely stocked to begin with, empty by the second day. Refrigerated goods spoil. Frozen foods thaw. Supply trucks, immobilized by dead engines and non-functioning logistic networks, never arrive. People begin rationing, not because they want to, and, but because they must. In this environment, community becomes the dividing line between resilience and collapse. Neighborhoods that communicate, organize, and share resources survive far more easily than those who isolate. A single working generator can refrigerate insulin for several families. A shared water filter can prevent sickness across an entire street. A rotating night watch patrol can deter opportunistic theft. But where fear replaces communication, the opposite takes shape. Gas stations, pharmacies, and grocery stores become flashpoints of tension. Arguments turn to fights. Panic becomes visible. The thin layer of social order, the routines, schedules, systems, and unspoken trust that once held daily life together begins to fray. Law enforcement now operates under extreme limits. Radios are unreliable. Vehicles stall. Officers patrol on foot or bicycle, prioritizing only the most critical threats. 911, once an omnipresent safety net, is now a silent memory. This is the moment where Americans come face to face with a truth long hidden by convenience. Stability is not guaranteed, it is maintained. And without the infrastructure, that quietly sustain modern society, individuals and communities must confront decisions once left to systems, authorities, and institutions. Who receives the last doses of refrigerated medicine? Who drinks the clean water first? Who stands guard through the night? These questions are no longer theoretical. They are now daily calculations made under pressure in a world without power, time, or certainty. The first week ends not with resolution, but with a new understanding. Life has changed, and the old world is not coming back quickly. By the end of the first week, those who have survived have done so through some combination of preparedness, improvisation, cooperation, and hard choices. The shock has faded. The questions of what happened have given way to what now? Communities begin to organize formally. Manual tools replace digital systems. Bulletin boards and handwritten notices become the new communication networks. Schools and community centers, once hubs of planned learning and routine, transform into distribution points for shared water, canned goods, and medical knowledge. Skills that once seemed outdated, gardening, mechanical repair, first aid, radio operation, now define leadership and value. People rediscover the power of local knowledge. A retired nurse becomes the medical authority. A mechanic becomes essential to mobility. A hunter, a farmer, a carpenter, each becomes a pillar of survival. The economy shifts too. Currency loses meaning when digital banking is offline and physical cash is limited. Barter emerges. Food, medicine, batteries, hand tools, these become the new units of trade. Yet amid hardship, something else reappears. Resilience. Human beings have lived without electricity for 99% of our history. What feels impossible is not new. It is simply forgotten. Communities that share, adapt, and coordinate begin to stabilize. Gardens are planted. Wells are repaired. Hand crank radios become lifelines. Life does not return to what it was, but it continues, reshaped around necessity. And slowly, at regional and national levels, restoration begins. Military engineers rebuild substations by hand. Emergency convoys move across the country under manual coordination. Technicians work to restore isolated pockets of grid function. Progress is slow, measured in neighborhoods, not cities. But it happens. 
The greatest lesson left behind is not about technology at all. It is about dependency. Modern life is built on invisible supports. Power, water, logistics, communication. When those supports disappear, survival does not come from panic or force, but from skills, cooperation, readiness, and composure. The EMP changed the United States, but it did not end it. It forced a return to fundamentals, water, food, shelter, community, discipline, and most of all, the ability to think clearly when the world around you does not. In the end, the question was never just, what happens when an EMP hits the US? But rather, who are we when the lights go out?